What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? I'm about to sit here and check out this uh, interview with Elvis Presley's bodyguards. Um, <clears throat> I believe they are trying to set the record straight on some things, but we're about to watch this and find out. So drop me a comment. Let me know what you think. Uh, and I think this is kind of important to watch because everybody has their, uh, their opinions on the Memphis Mafia. I know I have my opinions. So uh, let's check this out. Drop me a comment. Let me know what you think. Other than that, let's get into it. I think he was a, a victim of himself and the, the image and the legend. And... Do you regret having written the book? And what impact do you think his death is going to have on it? I, I don't have regrets for writing the book. I have a lot of sorrowful feelings about the timing because what's happening now the rumors that are going about is that there are some rumors around trying to portray us as bloodsuckers who wrote this book to <coughs> capitalize on the death of Elvis Presley and they never seem to realize that the book was written a year ago uh, when he was alive well, David, David, David Sonny, uh, at the spur of the moment, many times before, Elvis used to go up and, and just buy gifts for people, for automobiles and everything else. Why did he do that? He loved to give. Did the it, drugs have anything to do with that? I don't think so. I think it was just mm -hmm. the spirit. He, and he wanted to see the person's face when he gave it to him. I mean, it was, uh, he was insistent upon that. He liked to see, and he would be with him and share it with him, boy, for that time. And then the next day, he didn't want you to mention it, that, you know, it, it was gone and passed, and that moment was it, and he gave it to you. And he wanted you to just accept it in that sense, that he enjoyed giving it to you, and he didn't want you to carry on about it over a period of time. Excuse me. And uh, he loved to give, I am it's... We went with him one time to a, a black lady in Memphis that he had read about in the paper that was crippled. And he read about it, just an article in there, no special appeal thing, and he went and bought the most expensive wheelchair, electric wheelchair, and took it over to her and gave her some money and stuff. I mean, this way it was. What, what feedback had you ever gotten from Elvis on the book? Did you get any of that? No. No. He said he wasn't worried about it. What did he mean, do you think? He just meant that he wasn't, he knew, he knew, man, that we loved him. He knew that we weren't going to chop him up or, or try to ax him or anything. He knew. He knows now that, I'm telling you. What was the purpose of calling this press conference? I'd like you to spell it out. To counteract what we think people have gone around without reading the book, just going out and thinking from hearing from someone on a certain individual on, on different shows about their reaction to the book and they haven't read the book and that some of the people that are talking haven't read the book and we think that they're i think it deserves a fair thing for us to be able to say our side and how much we did love the guy and how much admiration we had for him when we wrote this book it was it was out of bitterness and hurt to start with i tell you when we were given three days notice by his father in a week's pay after 16 years 20 years two and a half three years with dave we all had families and he wouldn't talk to us himself. He flew out of town, and he had his father do it. Why did he terminate you? At the time, no, at the, at the time, it was told us by his father that there was a cutback on expenses, which I knew wasn't true. And he called me, and he said, so we're going to have to let a few people go. And I said, and I'm one of the people? And he said, yeah. He said, but there's going to be others. And I asked him, well, would you tell me who? And he said, no, I'd rather tell him personally. It turned out to be Dave and Red. And... Since then, there have been rumors that got back to us that it was because of the lawsuits uh, that, that were against him. One for me where I had hit a guy up in Tahoe that was trying to break in a, a locked exit door and turn out all our utilities and had drawn back on Elvis's stepbrother. When I got to the hallway, he was drawn back and I, I hit him. And that was the only, I was only time. I chops and Elvis had never touched him. So that was going nowhere. But it was a hassle. He had to go give his deposition. He had to go up to the hotel there, to Tahoe, and give a de deposition. And the man put his hand out to this guy, Ashley, that was still hurt when we let go. What about when you wrote the book? Well, if you read the book, I don't think you'll see bitterness. 
Well, I, we don't have, I don't have time to read the book before I write a story. We are the daily paper. I haven't got time to sit down and read the book. I've got to hear what you have to say. Well, that's unfortunate because the problem is, is that, you know, everything is inexorably tied into the book. And, uh, you know, I, I can't apologize for your lack of time not being able to read the book. Oh, well, your author, Dunleavy, seems to be prompting all the... He's read the whole book, I assume, since he wrote it. He keeps talking about drugs all the time. You well, he's sensationalism. I mean, he writes for the star. He can't. As you know, it's on the, on the same thing as the, as the Inquirer, the sensationalism type thing. He's writing for the New York Post, too. He's running uh, a series of articles in there. And when we met him, he wasn't like that when we were with him last year. I mean, he was interested. He broke down with us during the interviews when he saw one of us get moved, when we would call an instance of what this man had done. And I couldn't believe that was the same guy up there. I could not believe. Have you tried to talk to him? What would you tell him if you could talk to him right now? I would tell, oh, I would tell him, Steve, well, I can't say what I'd tell him. Tell him uh, no, it would be curse words. I mean, I would call him a name. And I said, what are you doing, man? Who are you? You you were someone we told a story to, and you're going up there and, and blasting into him like that and saying the whole thing's about drugs. It's not. There's love and admiration in there. Is the book a misrepresentation? Not at all. It's fact. It is true. Well, where is the sensationalism? You know? The drugs thing that he keeps trying to, to bring up as the main thing, and it's not. Keeps, the keeps drug things are mentioned drugs. in there minutely. If you read it, you'll see it. And, but he went up there and could watch this man being embalmed uh, that, you know, that was alive and well th that day or something before. And, and I couldn't do that. But he would just, he was fat. It wasn't uh, a thing of where he was an org type of thing and things with their hands he was into all of these things it wasn't just with death he was he was curious about everything in life he really was yeah, it wasn't it wasn't are you going to morbid why, why are you here we California? have been told by we live here. someone that his father doesn't want us there and do you think dunleavy's a phony now after all this i, I mean, think that what i saw today was phony from the guy that i met a year ago yes i do think he's a phony Dave, you seem to be implying before that you were writing the book in part to try and get Elvis to change his ways. Is that is that right? You bet. That was one of the reasons. There were a number of reasons for writing the book. Number one, uh, we felt that the manner in which we were discharged uh, wasn't right. I mean, any any employee or has the, the the inalienable right to fire any employee. No question about that at all. But nobody has a right to, to treat you like a piece of garbage. You know, nobody. And number two, uh, to continue with that, is, uh, again, you know, we, to, to reiterate what we said earlier a couple of times, we, we wanted to point out to him, you know, what he was doing, not only to himself, but to the people around him. And uh, we, we didn't want him to, to be what he was. We wanted him to be what we knew he could be and had been, you know, again. Uh, and thirdly, we wanted to, my God, we had families, you know, and we're sitting out in the streets, and uh, what are we going to do? Be 40-year-old stuntmen or? I wanted to add one thing yeah, to that. Yeah. See, that's what I mean. A certain individual took okay. the quote thing from me in the front page right. about maybe it will do some good. He didn't know what it means. He says, what does it mean it'll do some good? If he had read the book, he would have found in there that we were trying to present him with a challenge. Because if he looked back and saw all these things roll in front of him and know that they were true, I don't know how he might have dismissed them in his mind as the years went by. Well, it wasn't like... But when he saw it, the way that it happened, like anyone else, when you read something about your former life or anything that you've done years ago, the reality of it is in front of you. It's not something you can... Do. You know how then, how it was. And that's what I meant when I said maybe it will do some good for him, for the drug culture, for people to realize no one is out of reach of drugs, man. Here is a man that had it in the palm of his hand and started off with it that way, and the drugs took it away from him. Have you, okay, that's have it. You, I'm sorry. Now, we had to wait, so, you, yeah. you know, yeah, you, you, this is a two-way situation. Wait. Being a contributory factor. What's your response to that? Absolute nonsense. You know, how, how could it possibly have, you know, as a matter of fact, he even stated himself that, you know, he wasn't concerned about the book. And uh, according to to people, and you've seen it on the newscast, he's been, he's been uh, for the last week, been very happy and looking forward to this upcoming tour. Sonny, was his, did his depression ever uh, uh, lead him to uh, be suicidal at all? No, no, he's no, too never. strong a person. No, no never. never. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you know how much the book is sold? How many copies it sold? We have no idea. It just, it just was released? We have no idea and we don't even really care. Gentlemen, when you sit down, you can split the mics, please. Yeah. And kind of speak up. Thank you. Hey, as you look at the table, Dave Hebler is on the show. Do you have a statement to make, or are we just going to ask you some questions? Uh, no, it, the reason that we were are here is to uh because we've we've seen some of the coverage on this and we think that it's been entirely put in the wrong light by different individuals and uh we'd like to see if somehow we can get it straight what is the straight the straight is that we love that man that's what the straight is and uh i'm telling you no one could have been more shook up by that man dying than me and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And uh, we wrote this. We started on this a year ago. Speak up, please. <coughs> we started on this a year ago. And there's been nothing added, anything different than what it was already. The book was already completed. And we didn't, we didn't expect anything like him to do this because otherwise it would have gone on and whether he put a lawsuit against us or whatever he would have done but if you love the man why do you drag all of this information out and make it public have you read the book i have not okay reading, where do you read it i'm reading the synopsis right well read the book please i mean you don't have to buy it just read it from someone or hear someone that's read it and you find out that it's not the drug thing that's in there that's so sticks out it's the things that we did crazy the good times the things we had and how we felt that the drug things changed him into the person that he became that's all his health and everything but we did not specify that the drugs were the whole thing throughout i understand that well, well, why, 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 you, why do you want to tell that part that side of elvis well I ever since i've known elvis this man has needed a challenge and he's met it <coughs> He did it in 1973 when he is overweight he was going to do a satellite show going into 25 countries a billion people people had never seen him perform before and he knew it and he went on a diet <coughs> he got down to about 165 pounds the best i had seen him look in several years and he put on a dynamite show and then he went right back to what he was doing before he just didn't care i don't know if he was getting bored he loved performing but the time in between all the time that he wasn't on that stage for that hour i guess the man was just bored and he was trying to find different things to do he would he would get toys or, or things grown up things like three wheelers and ride them around memphis just for an hour or so just to get out i mean the man was limited he could be in the middle of the crowd and he could be lonely he was one of the loneliest men i've ever ever seen in my life and we tried to be with him and, and protect him and keep him happy as the best we could. I swear to God we did, man. Sonny, you, Sonny, you said you didn't understand Sonny, why he did what he did. What do you mean by that? On, on what part? You were saying, I just don't understand why he did it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what you meant by that. Did what? Why he did the drugs? Yeah. Yeah. I guess because he was bored. He was bored. And, and unless he was on stage, the man didn't have anything to do. What drugs are we talking about? Was he hooked? We're talking about uppers and downers. We're talking about sleeping pills. We're talking about things like Demerol. We're you, talk, yes. You actually saw him take Yes. Drugs? Yes. Was he a constant <laughs> user of drugs? Is what you're talking about? <laughs> he would get on and off of them. I mean, it was, uh, he would get on them. Uh, I guess, that, like I said, out of the boredom, and then he would, when he knew he had something to do and he had to be straight, he would he would go ahead and 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 clear himself out of them for a while and just and just take the sleeping pills to go to sleep and not get totally out of it. Like after an engagement in Vegas, the first couple of days he would stay there, boy. After not being able to do anything, he step take sleeping pills and his uppers and things. He would just for the first two days just get totally wiped out on Demerol and things and just sit there and not even be able to open his eyes. Just running over a period of how many years? Was he involved in taking drugs? 
Well, he told us that a sergeant started him on benzedrine or dextrine or something in the army when he was on maneuvers out in the, the uh, snow and everything. Uh, the sergeant said he didn't want the guys falling asleep, getting frostbit or, or frozen to death. He gave them, and this wasn't army policy, it was just this sergeant had got them. And <clears throat> Elvis started using them then. When he came back, and I started for him in 1960, he was working out in karate. He had started, you know, learning this art over there, and he was very enthused. And, and I started working out with him, and he was showing me, using me as what you call a dummy, where I would throw the punch and he would show the counteracting moves. And we started coming out here on the movies, and we started taking the diet pills with him because he was, uh, at the time, it was just diet pills, and then he would take sleeping pills to counteract and go to sleep, and we did the same thing. We were out on locations, we were playing football in 100 degree weather out here at Caneo on Flaming Star and the director, no one knew how we did it. It was because of the uppers. Well, based, on what, you, and based on what you know, about, <coughs> do you believe that he died of natural causes or do you believe that he died of a blood overdose? I don't know because I think one might contribute to the other. I think that uh, I'm, I'm not a doctor, I don't know what drugs do to your body, but I would think that over a period of time that if you took enough drugs, down drugs, regardless of... Uh, you know, what he did with them, as, as long as he took them and kept taking them over that period of time, I would think that the body would start deteriorating. I, I would think that the heart wouldn't be up used to the up and down, that it would be underneath the pressure from cocaine or from, from uppers and then back to a real low beat. I, I don't know. I, I think cocaine, when, did Sonny, cocaine did? Yes. Sonny, when Sonny, there were reports that not only was he pretty heavily into cocaine and quaaludes, but... Uh, that he also was on some of the even harder stuff, the, the good hard drugs, heroin, for example. No, Did he ever do that? I swear to God, I never saw him take any heroin, never. I think oh. that that might have. I think it might have frightened him. He he felt manipulating. Uh, that's how he got into the downers because in the movies he noticed himself up on the screen talking so fast that he felt that he needed to counteract it and slow down because he, he would say, "I can't even understand that southern guy up there talking about himself." And he started experimenting with things to get him up and things to keep him there instead of taking him on up as high as the diet pill would because he, I think that he was inhibited by cameras. He could get in front of a live audience and man, everything came out of him. But I just think the impersonality of a camera and the way it stares at you and, and I, I felt that he felt really shy because he was basically shy and I think that he felt basically shy in front of the camera so much that he started giving these to give him confidence because I've taken diet pills and they give you confidence. Did, yeah. he, did he ever have uh, illegal supplies of drugs or were they all prescription drugs? No, the only ones I knew of were prescription, mm -hmm. but in such amounts. He, he had so many doctors. I, I you know cocaine? Well, the cocaine didn't come from the doctors. It came from people that got it to him that weren't associated with him uh, in the capacity of a doctor. And there's an incident in, in the book relating to that about how my cousin Red charged in to stop it one time. I think he broke the guy's toe or something going through the door and told him that he was going to break him up if he didn't quit getting the stuff to him. And Elvis heard about it. And uh, meantime, they had been mixing BX powder or whatever you call it uh, with the stuff and, and grading it down. And he it wasn't doing anything for him. And then he asked the guys about the stuff, and they finally admitted that they were scared and had been frightened by Red. And he called Red and Joe in to the, a bedroom at a hotel on tour, and he told them that there would be no more bullying tactics, no, no scaring tactics, because these guys were scared of him, and that they discussed it for a while. And then finally he looked at Red and said, I'll never forget it. He said, I need him, man. I need it. And Red said, if you need it, then I won't ever do anything else about it. And that was the last attempt that Red had made from then on to, to stop things getting to <coughs> We used to take things that came to him and break them down and change them. Change what was in the, the pain pills and things that he took. See, this is, this is why I say it was all prescription stuff that he would get that I saw it except for the cocaine. The well, did the other doctors know? In other words, he had three or four doctors who would be maybe giving him the same prescription. One doctor wouldn't know. In different that cities and not knowing it. Yes, sir, that is very possible. The person who really? wrote, put the book together, Dunleavy, he said, I don't know if you've been pleased with the guy. Only being out when he was a week and a half, two weeks at a time, just from the plane to the hotel, from the hotel to the building to do the show, and back to his hotel room and locked in there till, we, till he left the next day. And when he couldn't stay up high, 
and he, he was just bored, and he would take these things to get him on stage and do it, and then he would take something to put him out so he could go to sleep because he had to get up the next day and go to another city. He's but once he's on the stage, he's, he's performing with everything he's got. He loved it. Dave, how do you feel about all this? Dave, are you in agreement? Yeah. yeah. Did you see all this yourself? I'd like, I'd like to respond to it in, in a couple of ways. Uh, number one, I'm a little bit distressed about the total emphasis on, on drugs and that particular aspect of our life, Elvis's life, because it really wasn't, you know, just that. There, there were a number of things. We lived with the man, you know. We loved him, we cared for him, and I think it was reciprocal. Uh, the book very clearly I think, demonstrates that we had nothing but total respect for the man. We wanted more than anything else to see him as he was in his prime, on the stage just knocking him dead, you know? <clears throat> mm. I'm going to have to, you know, here goes my two cents, you know what I'm saying? It was like um, looking at two snakes, you know what I mean? Uh, the only way that I could have vibed with what they were saying is if that book came out while they were still working with Elvis, you know what I'm saying? And then you heard it out this man's mouth himself. He said, um, at first it was bitterness, you know what I mean? At first, so you was hurt. So, you know, one minute it was bitterness, and then it, it was straight um out of love um um maybe it'll do some good you know because we want Elvis to be back to this so we want him to do that we know we know he can be here but i think that's what they failed at they forgot that Elvis was grown they forgot that you should go be what you want to be just because shit ain't the same and you still riding the Elvis wave, you can't make Elvis be something that he's not desired to be, don't want to be. It's a grown ass man. And I believe that um, they should have left that cocaine shit out the mix. Number one, that's an illegal activity. If you want to sit here and talk about the, um, the prescription drugs and whatnot, eh, that's cool. Not really, but uh, leave the illegal shit out. You know what I mean? Leave that shit out. Because let's just say Elvis was doing it. You want to tell me he was the only one doing it? I'm pretty sure y'all was fucking around with it too, if that's how y'all want to uh, uh, put the shit. But um, snakes though. You know, you can't want to help somebody or got real love for somebody when you sit there. <clears throat> if you writing a book and the only thing you put in there is the good times. We was playing football. We was on a set of these movies. Um, the shows here, here, and here. That's cool. As soon as you start throwing negative shit on there about drugs and whatnot, and and the love life and all this shit, you you officially took yourself out the friend zone. You officially took yourself out the friend zone, and that's just how I see it. Um, I can't see it no other way, nor do I want to see it no other way. I'm just saying, like y'all, y'all, y'all fucked that up. Y'all fucked that up. And then on top of that, did you see how how defensive that they was getting? You know, maybe I can understand that if y'all really thought y'all had good intentions, but it seems like y'all was mad and getting offensive because people called you out on your shit. People was calling you out on your shit. You know what I mean? Because I, I don't like reporters, but these reporters had some some legit questions. Some legit questions. And these people right here could not give no answers at all. They could not give no answers. They came and what they were trying to do, they failed miserably at. Without question, they failed miserably. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't think it was sincere. If it was sincere, the book would have came out prior to, you know what I mean? Um, Y'all getting fired. You know what I mean? Uh, but you were just mad. You know what I'm saying? That you got fired. 
the bottom line that shit came down to what y'all had said was, man, we got families, which is a true story. But y'all chose to live the life of free traveling. You chose to uh, live the life of being up Elvis's ass twenty four seven, um, getting asked because Elvis was in the building. Of course, you Elvis's bodyguard, you Elvis's friend. Y'all chose to live that life. You know what I mean? Uh, that was a choice. It's not. It's not Elvis's fault that y'all didn't have no other trades when the ride was over. You know what I mean? When the ride was over. Y'all was sitting there looking stupid as fuck, and y'all wives was looking at y'all probably like, now what? You just done playing all this time, you know what I mean? It's like, um, like the Elvis situation reminds me of, like, somebody who was, like, in um, college and got all these degrees and, and all this shit, and they go out every weekend, they buy the shirts they want, they go to the fancy restaurants and all that shit, and you were just being his friend. Um, you don't have no education. You don't have no degrees. You don't have anything. But your man has all of that stuff. You know what I'm saying? So you sit here and you enjoy doing this. You enjoy doing that. But as soon as he goes to a new job, or as soon as he's done having fun every weekend and he goes to all these restaurants and traveling, you get stuck. You get lost. You know what I'm saying? Um, you get lost in the sauce. You forgot your own identity. And to be honest with you, if you was working for, uh, 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 with this man since the 60s, it's kind of safe to say that you never even had no identity. This man was your identity. You know what I mean? And that that's a clear case because for years, even after this interview right here, we didn't seen documentary after documentary and, and, and interview after interview if y'all living your life still off of this man still living your life off of this man and it just didn't pay out how y'all thought it was and you was hurt you was hurt you didn't think that um you was going to be you know kicked the fuck out fired and all that shit right there you was hurt you was bitter you threw salt on this man's name when he wasn't even here to defend himself the only thing that people could do was speculate off of what you guys were saying and that's no fair to Elvis Presley um so I don't see no admiration I don't see no love I believe y'all did love Elvis but I think y'all love more of what Elvis can do for you like I said that's a traveling all expenses paid, the cars, the Christmas gifts, the just because gifts, the paychecks, the women, the drugs, um, just the fancy life, the casinos, probably having credit and all types of shit was gone like that. And it hits you and your ass woke up. You woke up and when you woke up, you was in a bad mood. You was in a bad mood. So... Me personally, I will never tell no negative shit about none of my peoples. If they didn't put it out there, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's not to be put out there, period, point blank. That's just that's just how I'm coming. You know what I'm saying? That's what a real friend is. A real friend is not finna acknowledge. You don't have to lie, but you don't have to acknowledge certain, certain shit either. Like, there's no need to acknowledge cocaine. I don't give a fuck if he was doing more cocaine than Bobby Brown. You know what I'm saying? That's not for us to know unless Elvis himself came and told us that. And seeing he didn't do that, y'all shouldn't have put that in the air. You know what I'm saying? Period, point blank. Um, another man's truth is just for that man to tell. And it's not even another man's truth. Another man's life is for him to tell, not for somebody else to tell. Period, point blank. But drop me a comment most definitely. Let me know what you think about this interview right here. Do you think that these, these fellas were sincere? Do um, you think they really had real love for him all the way up until the end? Uh, yeah, how was your whole thought process on watching this interview? Drop me a comment and let me know.